urbanism at London Met. And as Matthew was mentioning, I'm the deputy director of the Research Center Cube, the Center for Urban and Built Ecologies that hosts this event. Uh, they, the event is titled Autopia, the Real and Ideal in the Architecture of John Autram, and will be chaired by uh, Professor Matthew Barak, who will introduce the topic and the speakers in a moment. Uh, before giving the floor to Matthew, I just wanted to thank all of our panelists for joining us this evening, and it's a great pleasure to have you here. And Matthew, I'd leave the floor to you for the introduction. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, uh, we've been uh, in contact with the author of this evening's book, uh, Geraint Franklin, for some months to discuss this event. And I'm very pleased to, it's really something of a flashback for me, but I'm very pleased to uh, introduce the panel tonight to talk about um, this new book that's coming out about John Utrum and his work. Um, the uh, the, the reason, one of the reasons for this is that I worked for John Utra many, many years ago when I was a student during one of my summers and met a number of people who are on the panel at that time, as well as several others in the magical place that was his office uh, back in the 80s. Um, and so uh, it's great to be able to talk about this uh, extraordinary architect and his work uh, and the culture of his office um, this evening. Um, we're really here to celebrate uh, the launch of uh, this new book by Peter Thurg, by um, Geraint Franklin, and we've assembled a panel um, of uh, um, uh, directly involved uh, past uh, members of his office, as well as others uh, such as um, Professor Peter Sinjin from London Metropolitan University, and of course Caruso Sinjin, who uh, is. It, it w was influenced by his work at the time and has many interesting things to say about it. So uh, I'm going to just, so now that I've introduced uh, the three panel members in brief, um, as well as the speaker, I'm going to uh, hand over to Geraint. Geraint is a historian who specializes in British architecture uh, since the war. He's the author of How Killick, Partridge and Amos, um, a 2017 publication, Postmodern Buildings in Europe in 2017 with Elaine Harwood, and uh, his new book is John Utram. Thank you very much for uh, being here tonight, Geraint, and over to you to make, to, to, to present uh, the book. Thank you, Matthew and Beatrice. Um, and it's great to be here. I'm going to start um, and see if I can share um, the visual content. Um, That's great, Gary. Okay. You can see your screen. You go full screen, it'll be great. Okay. Is that perfect? Great. I now can't see you, but that perhaps matters less. We can see you. Okay, so you, you can see that. That's great. Okay. Um, okay, brilliant. And you're seeing the slides change. Okay. Gotcha. Well, it's great to be here. Um and um this is kind of one of um, several events re really celebrating the book and in a wider sense, uh, the architecture of John Utram Associates. And the book uh, comes out on Friday. So um, there it is. Um, I'm really happy with the thing. It's, it's in fact the second, um, it, it, let me start by saying it comes out as part of um, the 20th century Architects series, uh, which is sort of co-published by Historic England with, uh, in partnership with uh, the 20th Century Society, the Immunity Society um, for this post-1914 period, and also um, Liverpool University Press. Um, and it's the 19th title in that series, and I'd um, encourage people um, John is joining the ranks of many sort of illustrious 20th century British architects. So um, I hope he feels um, comfortable there. Um, it's a sort of really an accessible introduction to the subject. So one is um, summarizing and um, encapsulating in a relatively pithy way. So it's, a, it's great within the span of, of event like this to be able to stretch one's legs uh, and um, really um, talk in a more more exploratory uh, mode and, and sort of 
begin to unpack some of the ideas um, that are explored um, in the book. In particular, what I'd like to talk about is, is one aspect of John's works, um, and that's, if you like, um, the sort of architectural imagination of, of John Utram. Uh, that's what I'd like to expand on. Now, for, for, for those of you who are architects, this, this is um, terra firma, dealing with the nature of uh, creativity. For architectural historians, this is perhaps uh, we like to think of ourselves as, as dealers in fact, so this is perhaps less familiar um, uh, territory. Um, so, so there's an interesting tension there for me. Uh, in, particularly, in particular, I'd like to um, really talk about um, the sense in which John's architecture um, represents an incomplete or a provisional realisation of a, a fictional ideal. So it's that sense um, I want to explore this evening. And um, to make that clear, you won't find a single photograph of a building in my slides. Um, uh, I have no apology for that. So if there's anyone who wants to deal in um, the, the architecture, you have to buy the book. Um, of course, the, the later speakers um, might want to enlarge on um, the material or tectonic aspects of John's architecture. I think the, the magic of his architecture is the way those two worlds come together, and uh, hence the title um, of, of this session um, between the real and, and the ideal. So my, my talk's in three parts. Uh, the first concerns the rich zone of overlap between architecture and fiction. Um, John, John Utram often thought and sometimes designed in terms of two parallel realms, the, the tangible world of material objects and its metaphysical counterpart in the form of an immaterial or imaginative dimension. The second part of my talk is entitled Utopia. I couldn't resist that one. And it explores the concept of the other in the urban imagination. It sets uh, Utram's own concept of the anti-city against Aldo Rossi's idea of the analogous city and Foucault's texts on heterotopia. Lastly, I look at Utram's rights for an urban architecture as a means of bridging the gap between theory and practice. So let, let's go ahead, um, fiction and architecture. In, the, in his foreword to the book, Joseph Rickvert um, calls John Utram the architect storyteller. So I'll start by talking about the role of invention the generative potential of fiction in the architectural imagination. Architecture stands at the threshold between what we could call the real world and the territory of the imagination. There are words which drop some pretty big etymological hints at the connections. Um, fabrication, um, edification, story, pun intended. Uh, just as there are works of speculative fiction, which encompass imaginary buildings and cities, there exists a subgenre of architecture based on fiction. Let's take the contemporaneous examples of Jorge Luis Borges' Library of Babel and uh, the Danteum, uh, Terrani's projection of the form and the rhyme structure of Dante's Divine Comedy. And it's interesting that those two works are almost exactly contemporaneous. I think John uh, wanted to tell stories for the same reason we all want to hear stories. Stories are the oldest medium. Uh, they construct narratives of origin and self-identity. They affirm collective beliefs and values. Um, they're the means of escape from reality or its contestation. Above all, they illuminate some deeper truth. It was John Utram who wrote, quote, fiction is a stranger who shows us the truth. Now, we could go further and identify the presence of literary devices in his design processes. We could um, look for rhetorical tropes such as um, metonym, personification, hyperbole, 
dissimulation, the suspension of disbelief. He felt that, quote, an idea is best communicated not by its literal imitation, but by a mediation upon its qualities expressed as opposites. He goes on, light against shadow, flames against ember, clear air against black smoke, represent fire better than each wood on its own, unquote. So we have uh, the, this idea of a kind of dualism, um, which I think really, for me, lies at the heart of, of John's architecture. That there's this notion which is um, um, highlighted in, in Robin Evans' book, The Projective Cast, as, as the architecture of um, the, the architect's re reconciler, as, as a synthesizer of opposites. He, he talks about that in relation to Le Gubusier, but I think it's perhaps equally applicable here. And the, ab the ability to fix polar opposites in a single image is incidentally a defining characteristic of poetry and myth. Instead of a dialectic, we can talk in Utrum's case of a trialectic, the three-legged stool of design, allegorical drawing and writing. John even devised a symbol for the unity of the eye, the mouth and the pen-wielding hand, which he termed a tricorso. A letter Utrum wrote in 1980, note that early date, to the American architectural historian Vincent Scully, shed light on what almost seems like a competition between fiction and tectonics. I quote, writing forces me to dissolve the corporality of architecture into the thinner stuff of ideas. So watery is this substitute that I'm driven to go on inventing more and more metaphors layers of iconography until the writing achieves a little of the density of the building. Let's look at two of Utrum's fictional devices. He calls them the Empire of the Forest and the Republic of the Valley. And let's look at the way he deploys them as planning or compositional strategies. So in the first, we have the figure of the endless wood in which one walks through a space of eternal sam sameness, marked neither by the pa passage of time or space. This Utrum juxtaposes with Surleo's woodcut of a Greek hyperstyle hall, 10 columns square. A and in passing, so often he draws his, uh, his ideas um, from architectural history and they enter his imagination and become transformed. In the new house at Wadhurst, one of, one of John's early works, this infinite field of trees or pillars is marked out as absent columns in the patterned floor in a gesture towards its potential endlessness. And in some ways I'm reminded of the endless grid of, of Arcazum, the, the Italian collective. The module is extended out to, to the external hard landscaping with circles some of which serve as drain covers, marked in the ground like buried columns or tree trunks. He introduces cynic doche in the freestanding latticework columns on, on, the, on the garden terrace through which ivy was encouraged to grow. Then we have the Republic of the Valley, the stages of a river as it descends from its source in the mountains to the ocean. And I, I picked up on this, um, uh, this uh, image in, in the, my chapter, um, sort of naming the scheme. Um, now, this image was derived from the landscapes of the 17th century painter Claude Lorraine, whose work Utrum first saw depicted at the Hayward Gallery in 1969. There are both geological figures and depictions of human agency in the form of bridges, towers, classical ru ruins, and distant settlements. The river is a metaphor for the continuous sequence of lived time, while the expanse of the valley and the sea beyond indicates the spatial dimension. Onto the Claudian landscape, Utrum mapped um, a, a political construct derived from the French historian Gustave Glotz's 
and his studies of the Greek city of a community or a polity bounded by a river basin. While this iconographic narrative can be used to analyze existing places, such as a cathedral or a geometric garden, in Utrum's later work, it functions as an ordering device. At Duncan Hall, um, tributaries tumble downstairs, joining a whirlpool which flows eastwards down the main circulation spine before debouching into the goosefoot delta of the main atrium, seen right here. Well, let's now go on to examine one of Utrum's fictive cons constructs in more detail. His experience of the great European cities, above all Rome, left him with a conviction that the, they were not only the repositories of the shared values of a culture, but storehouses of a collective imagination. For every city, he maintained, there was an anti-city, its counterpart in the realm of the imagination, memory and dreams. When visiting Rome, he pictured the imaginary city floating over this physical city like its ghost or shadow. In the city, he wrote, one walks with one's head in the clouds and one's feet in the ground. Mind and body are simultaneously engaged. The figuration again takes the form of a binary opposition. Utrum writes that, quote, the history of the Western city has always included the idea of its denial, its absence and its contradiction. This creative dialectic between the present and the absence can be compared with Aldo Rossi's notion of la cita analogic, analogia, so apologies, the analogia city. What emerges from both is the primacy of collective memory, freedom of thought, and urban contingency. Uh, and I suppose the, 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 the collage technique and the idea of sort of a temporal juxtaposition. Rossi's uh, example, which he uses in his text, is Candeletto's um, Capriccio with, with um, showing Palladio, Pal Palladian buildings in, um, in, in, in Italian cities. Rossi wrote, quote, I maintain that it's important to illuminate the threads that lead imagination back to reality and both of those back to freedom, unquote. So the ultimate objective is intellectual freedom, liberation from the constraints of practice. Rossi drew on Carl Jung's idea of analogical thought as an imagined, as an imagined yet silent world, a, a, a meditation on themes of the past. But also correspondences with the idea of um, heterotopia or counter space as elabor elaborated by Michel Foucault as mythical and real cost contestations of the space in which we live, unquote. Foucault posits that, the, uh, that counter spaces have thresholds, points of entry and exit, which isolate them from their surrounding space. The openings to Utrum's anti-city take the form of iconographic decoration, figures which dematerialize the ground on which they are incised or inscribed. Why paint the city, Utrum asks, to make it disappear? Again, this idea of negation or opposition. Utrum writes about the need for, quote, a theory of urbanism than, that can create a city out of its everyday building projects. Now, two things strike me about this. Um, First, he's mediating between the scale of the city and its constituent buildings and, and urban blocks. Second, like Camilo Cite, he's interested in the re relationship between a city's monuments, its major public works, urban structure and so on, and the great mass of urban fabric that surrounds them. It's the latter, not the former, that embodies the city for Utrum. Nevertheless, Utrum employs the metaphors of entombment and um, excavation to show how the imagination can extract the vernacular mass um, and, and cast it away to contemplate its monuments standing in isolation on the underlying fields of the city. In other words, he imagines the recovery of the primordial landscape 
a return to an imagined original state, as opposed to, to the literal tabula rasa of the modernist urban project. Adjacent to this is another urban metaphor based on processes of geological erosion. Um, Uta imagines the streets of a great city as canyons or ancient watercourses which carve out city blocks like inhabited islands. City streets suggest dried up riverbeds, especially those paved with stone warm, worn smooth, like the ancient Roman roads surfaced with pol polygonal blocks of basalt. Now in the book, I've described this as a geomyth, borrowing a phrase coined in the 1960s by the geologist Dorothy uh, Vitaliano, but it's based on the dynamic city undergoing gradual and continuous evolution rather than architect imposed revolution. The geological metaphors are characteristic in establishing an equivalence by nature and culture, and that equivalence recurs time and again in, in John's work. So my, my third part, seven rights for an urban architecture. What's perhaps most interesting about Utram's urban fictions is that they can be put to work. They have, if you like, an instrumental value. He's using the imagination to progress towards what are ultimately a set of urban propositions. We see this most clearly in a set of schemes for the city of London um, that of sort of late 80s, early 90s date. Uh, and I devote a chapter to them in the book called City Slash Fields. Utram used these projects to codify his ideas about urbanism into seven rites or acts of ar architecture. He chooses rites because rites constitute a set of fixed words or actions, whereas myths, by, um, uh, by contrast, are dynamic elements of a culture. Taken together, they stand somewhere between a theoretical framework and a set of principles for urban design. We could make a comparison with Ruskin's seven lamps of architecture. I'll go through them here with reference to Utrum's unbuilt project for the, the Ludgate development in the city of London. So Grove, the first right, returns to the idea of the conceptual clearance of the site to recover the primordial landscape. In this case, a grove of four trees, which brings us back to the, the empire of the forest device. The second, cenotaph, an, an empty pyramid symbolizing a cone of fire or a common hearth is carried upon a raft which alights upon the grove. This is a rite of foundation and the result is a kind of primitive temple. The third rite, which Utram names cataclysm, returns to the notion of entombment and urban agglomeration. So here, the cenotaph temple is interred within the new building. From Mark Jozombach's study of Alberti came the enduring image of city monuments entombed by an accumulation of organic growth, of marble buried within brick earth. All that remains after the figurative burial of the city's monuments are vestiges of steeples and domes that, that rise above the roof line. Hence the fourth rite, entablement, which considers the attic story as a rooftop landscape of gods or ideas laid out above the entablature. Now this in entablature or tabling recalls Alfred Barr's juxtaposition of Corbusier's uh, Villa Savoy with its curved forms resting on a raised surface, seen right here, with um, Corbusier's still life of uh, objects arranged on a table or entabled to the left. And, and this is picked up um, in the 1960s by, by Rainer Bannum in, in, um, in, his, um, in his book. In the fifth rite, the narrative of the, ri of the river valley is enfolded into the building. We can see this in the long section of the competition entry for Bracken House, 
which shows a series of cascades within a central atrium. Inscription, the sixth rite, not illustrated here, represents surface decoration in the form of figures, ornament and paintings, which, as we've seen, are intended to make the, take the mind through the solid surfaces of buildings. In the final rite, the facade recapitulates the preceding stages. At the Ludgate project, the elements making up the window bays take up the story of the Republic of the Valley, a reminder that the site overlooks the outfall of the River Fleet, which is not fictional, but very real. It runs silently underneath our feet. Well, that seems like a good place to draw this story to a close. The Ludgate project was, in the event, never realised. So these drawings are, in a sense, fictions upon fictions. There's an interesting essay by Peter Cook called Unbuilt England, where he suggests that the notion of the unbuilt suits a country where so much is gentle, implicit or wry. The unbuilt is the architecture of the conditional tense. What might have happened? What would have happened if? This hypothetical mode is prevalent in the wonderful set of large scale collages of the abortive Ludgate project that John Utram's practice prepared for the Venice architectural architecture Biennale of 1991. And we see a detail uh, of one of those here. In one sense, this is the architecture of the possible. This design was perfectly buildable on his client's terms and within his client's budget. Yet the elevations are overlain with what Utram described as the savage beings of myth and my own fancy. The project had migrated to the realm of the imagination and there I'm pleased to report it remains. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Geraint. Um, if I can just ask you to unshare your screen, that's great. Um, fantastic. So um, that gives us a glimpse into the structure of the book as a whole, and also this 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 argument for understanding and interpreting um, the work of John Utram Associates, which which obviously has a sort of lifespan that we're looking at right now, but also in the way that you present it seems to extend into a sort of extended history uh, that goes back to ancient times and imaginary ancient times. Um, I'm going to uh, now um, ask the panelists uh, one at a time to respond and say a few words from their perspective um, on either specifically the um, structure of the, the, the book, as you've explained it, and the content of the book, um, or otherwise other reflections on uh, this oeuvre. Um, we're going to start with Gordana Fontana Giusti. Uh, Gordana is an architect, architectural theorist and professor of architecture and urban regeneration at the University of Kent. Her research focuses on the genealogy of architectural knowledge, urban landscape and visual arts, and the role of perspective representation in space, also mapping and digitalization of the urban landscape. Um, as well as teaching and lecturing, Gordana has been involved in urban design projects and designing urban installations for public spaces. She's the author of Foucault for Architects, co-editor and author of Scale, Imagination, Perception and Practice, um, and, uh, and of the complete works of Zaha Hadid. Um, and uh, I met Gordana many, many years ago when uh, she was uh, working with John Utram um, and in fact, a few other members of the audience here this evening. So uh, it's great to see you, Gordana. Over to you, uh, and please uh, take 10 to 15 minutes, uh, as long as you like, really. Thank you, Matthew. Lovely to see you, Matthew, and lovely to see some other faces here. Uh, and initials, really, who are also present uh, as persons behind the initials. Um, thank you, uh, Franklin. Um, uh, Mr. Franklin or Geraint uh, for your presentation. Uh, pleased to meet you for the first time this way. And first of all, I I want to say great uh, great talk. And I was a bit late, but I managed to pick up. And uh, I hope uh, I I sort of didn't miss too much. Um, congratulations for your book. 
which is a major achievement, something that I know I would never be able to do <laughs> because uh, we are dealing with something really uh, very complex and very difficult. And I would certainly never be able to do because I, I can't look at John Utram, as it were, with my uh, mind of a critic. <laughs> uh, sorry, Matthew, you, I know you invited us here as critics, but I'm immediately trying to kind of uh, find an excuse for myself. I find it difficult to do it because um, I did work for uh, John Newton practice uh, in the late 80s and in the early 90s on, uh, on and off, mainly as a PhD student and tutor at the AA who was working part time. Sometimes it was more, sometimes it was less, but it was on various projects and I was always deeply involved. Uh, but I was only always deeply involved with the whole project, with the John and his philosophy, uh, with uh, with his lovely family, uh, with um, that provided uh, the context for where we from where we were working, and um, that immediately kind of biased me from the very beginning. You know, I didn't sort of feel that I'm in some kind of um, professional relationship so much as in in a kind of adventure. Um, an adventure where John was um, the architect who had his imagination, dreams, conception, conceptions, um, et cetera, et cetera. But he was, as it were, almost like a captain of a ship where we were kind of all the rest of us. And indeed, many, many people who came there were of a similar kind, either students or recent graduates, and we were all in some kind of awe and fascination uh, with, with the creativity, with the sheer creativity that was coming uh, from, uh, from John. Uh, uh, for me, that, that was really the most important aspect of it. Um, I, and that's why I will never be able to reflect on it rationally or, you know, because I'm always kind of already kind of biased and can't detach myself. Um, I think you you sort of have chosen wonderful references and and you have chosen uh, correct references and you explain the right narratives um, and I would say uh, yes to to many points you made but um, I kind of think yes gosh I would have never thought that <laughs> although I know the reference but I would sort of think of that it's just because I I'm totally uh, out of out of any any uh, possibility of being a kind of an objective critic or or interpreter of the work in that sense, uh, because it was really uh, an adventure that we were all kind of led by this kind of great energy that this captain of this ship had for innovation, I should say, for architecture innovation that I was totally um, mesmerized with. Um, starting with really how he approached the whole kind of building process. He was at the time, I was mainly working on some architectural competitions and coming occasionally to his room to ask him how would uh, how would John like um, some details to be resolved. And, you know, I would ask for advice. And John would be in the middle of talking with uh, site architects, um, structural engineers, whatever, and, you know, he would then sort of inter interject that with a kind of little brief discussion with me where we would just sort of switch on to this kind of imaginary detailing. I think it was perhaps Brackenhouse or something where he would immediately um, move into the narrative of imagination um, of the streets, of the city, of the, of the, of the um, columns, et cetera, et cetera, of the still a bite at the time, which was uh, the narrative and so on and so forth. And I would just sort of totally uh, kind of trying to follow, really, uh, trying to follow the whole process. And then that would sort of erupt into into most incredible um, creative speech from him and clarification how he wants it. And then I would go back to my room trying to kind of interpret that in some kind of drawings. Um, and I was just amazed by that process, how he was able to kind of work on so many levels at the same time, running some sites and buildings on sites and directing some other colleagues on that and sort of working with us on the conceptual level. Why am I saying this now? It's because 
something when you uh, when you were kind of elaborating on on his uh, on John's seven rights for an urban architecture. That is actually, I would say, something that John didn't sort of find out for the books, uh, from the books, like I did mainly architecture, history, and theory from the books. But John actually he embodied it through his practice, and he learned it from his own practice. He came to these uh, seven points that you uh, have put forward: the grow, the um, well, the cat, uh, the cenotaph, uh, uh, the um, and entablement and facade, and all these uh, seven points that you have. You came to he came to that as as it were gradually. I, I remember at the time I would come to me, I would come to him, and he would tell me, "Oh, look, Gordana, what I have done," and he would show me. And that was all kind of coming little by little, one by one, in between all his kind of continuous production and and uh, and sort of work uh, that was happening and and was embodying all all his all his context really. So for me, that was kind of unbelievable. You know, that was the most uh, fascinating thing. And um, and I would I would have thought that would be very difficult for any author. On John's work uh, to capture that, did I did I use my ten minutes? Do I speak too much? Uh, that's 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 great, Gordana. That's absolutely yes. fine. If you have anything further to say, perhaps we can come back to it in yeah. the discussion section. Um, yeah, I will finish that, and I let other colleagues speak. But thank you for that. Uh, great. I think uh, yeah, no, I, the, especially the, this, these points about the the kind of the culture of the practice um, where you did feel part, I think, of a, an extended family of, as you say, like-minded people. It's an interesting set of observations and maybe one, one that we can we can. You were to. there, you were there, Matthew, as well. You, you came as a student in a year out and you were working there. Exactly. <laughs> or something. I, I, no, that's absolutely I remember right. It. That's how I met you first. So now I'm going to turn to uh, David, um, David Bass, in fact, I didn't meet at the practice, but through uh, some of the other people who were there at the time, Morjda um, Mamatsade and, and others, um, I met uh, David, but in fact, I was taught by David uh, in my third year at Cambridge University. David Bass uh, was an associate at John Utram Associates in uh, until 1993. And at that time, he took up a scholarship at the British School in Rome, where he went on to research relationships between film, architecture and urbanism. David has lectured widely. Uh, he has run design studios at Cambridge, the Architectural Association, University of East London for a long period of time, where he was a senior lecturer uh, until he stepped back from academia in 2014. And he's now a non-executive director at Marcus Beale Architects. Um, and he has also um, an independent portfolio, including uh, design projects in Ghana, as well as several projects in residential and retail architecture in the UK. Over to you, David. Thank you, Matthew. And it's so nice to hear you all again. And uh, I'm put in mind of working with John all that long time ago. Geraint, thank you very much for your book. I mean, it just brings everything back to everybody. And, and you've done a fantastic job of uh, figuring out the evolution of John's thinking in tandem with the evolution of his built work, in tandem with the evolution of his non-built work. Um, it's interesting just getting a taste of your brain again, Gordana. <laughs> you know, I'm reminded of many suppers and meetings with the Utrams and meetings in John's office as you say, trying to figure out ways of doing things and uh, kind of just feeding from the the source of 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 all that great thinking and and great architecture. I was taken with the what you said about how the, for instance, the seven rights didn't come from a scholarly working through of architectural history and theory. Um, I mean, John was scholarly, but incredibly um, eclectic at the same time. 
I think the the evolution of his architecture is also sort of not from the books. It's very much from his work and from making architecture. I I was really interested when I was there that we we kept and you were guilty of this too, Gordana. We kept on trying to find names for pieces of architecture. You know, John was not about the the sort of prissy correct deployment of uh, you know entablatures and metopes and all, you know he, he wasn't an assembler of classical architecture he was a maker of architecture from his own imagination and from the practicalities of 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 whatever project came up the, you know, the, the lexicon of Utram devices goes from cringles, which I don't remember what they are, <laughs> through to double bubbles, which we did a lot in Milton Keynes, through to teddies, which were part of a, a kind of a passive cooling system using heavy thermal mass in, in, the, in the Milton Keynes building. Um, what particularly intrigued me working with John was you know, many levels of hiddenness. That there, there was just getting into John's mind and finding out what what drove him. There was also the level of hiddenness about um, a kind of how architecture worked, and, and I was particularly fascinated by sort of seeing John's work through. A, a sort of Louis Kahn lens. I was fascinated by this relationship with, you know, the robot working elements, elements that weren't just presenting their appearance, but that were actually functioning in a particular way. Um, and, you know, John's uh, kind of innovations in terms of uh, environmental thinking were pretty phenomenal even back to, you know, harp heating in Swanley, which used a very sophisticated system of sun tracking blinds to stop solar gain. The project we worked on together, Gordana in, in Milton Keynes, although it wasn't built, so that's another sort of hidden aspect, really was trying to use the thermal flywheel effect to make a, a kind of comfortable um, office accommodation. Interestingly, the I, I remember the planners at Milton Keynes saying about that building, they were very keen that that building should be built because they said, but they were rightly proud of what Milton Keynes, what Milton Keynes was as a place, but they said there were no really good buildings there and no really finely detailed buildings there. And they were looking forward to the Utrum building. It has to be said that later on, they got some fine buildings um, by 6A architects and, and so on. But um, this business of architecture not only being having its own uh, sort of life of appearance and, and depth of structure, but actually architecture that worked in terms of distributing air and light. And all of that was completely consistent with John's kind of theories about uh, uh, well, how architecture should be made, not by the book, but by through the imagination and through practice. The, the, um, Geraint, the in your um, introduction, you have a lovely phrase where you say concrete, which John called a funereal porridge of muddy ashes, was redeemed by returning to the recipe when you're talking about blitzkrieg, the kind of crushed brick, crushed stone concrete. Um, and I think John did that with his architecture. You know, he never really accepted what a column was, what an entablature was. He always sort of looked at it afresh. And that, that sort of, that was really a, 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 a big sort of adventure, trying to reinvent architecture that actually also had a kind of archaic quality to it. I mean, John was, I, I remember we went on a, a, an office outing after some office supper and we all went to see Die Hard 2. Um, were you there, Matthew? Or, no, 
Um, and, uh, you know, John was just thrilled by, by, you know, these buildings with all their ducts and service spaces. And at some point, one of the villains gets crushed by a louver and um, sliced into pieces, I think. And John shouted out, kind of, and I think the audience could hear, he's been louvered. And thereafter, <laughs> thereafter, you know, louvers became something that we really attended to. I mean, John was, is just restless in his invention. And um, it was a fantastic time working for him. Um, I'm going to finish in a second, but um, like many people, I was on, I was marching along Piccadilly on Saturday for obvious reasons. Hi, Mojde. Is, is, sorry, this is too this is too cosy. Um, I was marching along Piccadilly in uh, on Saturday, and I was looking up at various buildings, and some of them had a kind of imaginative territory, you know, redolent of the seven rights, you know, the entablement and the kind of urban cataclysm, um, and I just thought. That you know, John is taking from the best of these buildings, not in any kind of copying way. And one particularly hit me, which I'm sure John is is familiar with, the um, Royal Insurance Building by Belcher and Joas, a kind of Edwardian architect with some very highly mannered um, uh, classical motifs. And I looked up historic England's definition of of. Uh, of, uh, sorry, it's listing description rather of that building this morning. And this phrase came up, it said, a willfully free use of classical motifs in a tense inventive design. And I thought, well, you know, that, that could be by John, a tense inventive design, willfully free use of classical motifs, not for their motivic kind of motif-like quality, but because of, how they participated in the story that he was telling. Um, I've got so many other reminiscences, but this isn't about reminiscence, and uh, I, I'm not capable of rising to the theoretical heights of either of my two, uh, uh, you know, the two speakers before me. So I shall call it a day here, and uh, I await any questions or comments. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, so we'll come back to some of these things in, in the Q&A uh, section or the discussion section. I mean, I think that um, both uh, uh, Gordana and David, you've, you've sort of spoken about this, spa this space of the practice that was created as uh, Gordana said, a kind of a ship and John was the captain of the ship. Um, and uh, th that, that space was a kind of a, a world of invention on the one hand, but also um, a space of freedom where the imagination could test things out. And there was also, I think, a lot of, of learning and um, a kind of openness to alternative futures, which um, is very similar, I think, to the ideal of the design studio in some ways. So I think it's great to be able to hand over now to uh, my colleague at uh, London Metropolitan University, uh, Professor Peter Sinjin. Peter is professor at at London Met and he leads unit 12 and has been doing for some years now, uh, which is a postgraduate design studio. Peter is partner at Caruso St. John, uh, an, archi uh, an architectural practice that has been that has been awarded um, the RIBA Sterling Prize and was commissioned a few years ago in 2018 to design the British Pavilion for the Venice Architecture Biennale in collaboration with artist Marcus Taylor and much of the work of Caruso St. John involves these kinds of artistic uh, collaborations. Peter has taught architecture throughout his career, both in the UK and abroad, uh, and he is currently external examiner at Scott Sutherland School of Architecture in Aberdeen. So over to you, Peter. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, thanks, Matthew. Thank you very much. And um, it's nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm, I'm an architect and I'm, I'm a teacher. I'm not an academic or, or a historian, um, nor, nor, nor did I ever work for John Utram, but it's uh, um, hopefully I can make a contribution and, and, I, and I definitely didn't want the last 
word. Uh, so I'm hoping there'll be a good discussion after after my contribution. Um, I, I, I did want to say that I really enjoyed the book, even though I haven't actually held it in my hand yet, uh, which I look forward to. Um, it, it's absolutely great to have a, a proper book about Utrum. Um, and maybe I, I just want to say that I feel um, a lot of respect for this work um, and, and there are some ways in which uh, I can identify um, with things that we really like in architecture, some. Um, I think partly because it's really interestingly built. Um, you really feel in these buildings that that um, its sculptural qualities are fully resolved with the tectonic and and there's a level of of, of solid integration of the pieces um, that is that is um, it's machine like and and uh, quite amazing for a building um, and and as well as its um, really interesting material delight. But I, I think perhaps what I, I mainly admire about it uh, is, is its iconoclasm, uh, it, its fearlessness, um, uh, and and its self belief, um, and the way that the work questions taste. Um, because I, I, in the end, I have to say I find it quite ugly. Um, even though the architect is obviously in con totally in control of the taste and and uh, to me that is its very strong artistic uh, statement its art as it were um the, the really strong feeling the, the provocation of the work um that the architect's unafraid the architect isn't afraid to, to declare values and the things that they find true um, whether it's beautiful or ugly, and and let's say the th the things he's he's talking about the things that he finds true in architectural culture, and and Grant talks about them as fictions. Uh, I suppose I'm 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 trying to say that they're I I admire it because they feel like truths it's about revealing things that the architect feels is, are there underlying in the ground in in the architectural culture of um, classicism let's say and and it's that it's extremely rare to find someone anyone who who's who's so willing to um to put to put themselves out there in such a provocative way um so so to me it's it's um sort of unlike unlike the way in which we always try and talk about work it's it's not about beauty it's more about belief and i and i find myself when i think about this work um just w wondering how british architecture uh, since then has become so impoverished um how on earth that happened I mean, I think one could talk all evening about that um, relative to this work and, and what it, what happens now, because it is relatively speaking, very impoverished British architecture. And and, you know, maybe some people think that my practice has had some some hand in that, um, although that's obviously not what I think. But um, uh, I, I think a few sort of background stories I wanted to mention was that was that this work is, from my point of view, being reminded from the book, but very much in 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 parallel with uh, the period of my life as a young architect in the eighties. Um, I worked for Jeremy Dixon. Uh, I worked on the Royal Opera House with uh, on the desk next to Carl Lobin, um, and I think Jeremy's work, I'm mean, thinking particularly of that um, terrace of houses he made in West London at St Mark's Road, 
um, which was a very important moment in changing the whole direction of um, housing, I think, to a much better version of, of urbanism in London. And then I also think um, uh, about um, the fact that Adam and Car Adam Caruso and myself met when we were working at Arab Associates, and it was our our um, our gossip and our dissatisfaction with the work that was being done by the practice, um, our, our disgruntlement as employees, um, because we felt that the work that the office was doing in the 90s was was really boring um, in comparison with the earlier work that uh, Philip Dowson did for Arab Associates with where it was much more, much more powerful structuralism, um, which was, we thought, an amazing thing and, and sort of brought us together, as it were. And then uh, it also made me um, think about, about um, the projects we're doing now, uh, we were working at um, Downing College and at Darwin, where there are projects by Bill Howell, the, the junior common room at uh, Downing and um, and the dining hall at uh, Darwin. And then just across the river, the amazing graduate building by um, Bill Howell that I think also has some well, reading Geraint's book has some connection to the, to the sort of background of this work. And um, all, all of these things have something in common with, with this work um, because it, it, it comes out of a very interesting, fertile architectural scene, I think, in comparison with now, I would say, of, of British architecture and architects that were teaching and training in the in the in the 50s and the 60s, um, which I find very interesting. Um, but I also uh, can see that it comes um, more deeply from from other British architects like um, Hawksmoor and uh, and Soane, and then um, also. Uh, architects that we we often talk about um, Butterfield and and Waterhouse, <coughs> who, who were of course Goths, but um, but whose buildings have have a sort of hardness and and a shininess uh, and a solidity that that I think has something in common with this work. Um, but I sort of wanted to finish by by saying that. Um, well, I sort of feel I have to have to be honest and say that I find I find um, John Utram's version of classicism distinctly ugly. <clears throat> um, it's something to do with with its um, with its strange proportions. It, it's 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 kind of hor not just its incorrectness. That's kind of much too precious a thing to worry about but but it's but it's to do with its horizontality um and the sort of fatness of everything and it and it um it made me think of when adam and i worked for philip dowson and and we were the young boys who he used to enjoy talking to and he used to tell us to get rid of those horizontal mullions because we were building in Britain and um, and uh, it was rainy and the skies were dark and if you put a horizontal mullion in it would just get you get stains or, or dust under the mullion and you needed the windows to be as tall and, and the facade to have a depth but not too much depth because of the of the light which we always used to think was very funny but I suppose it maybe it did have some deep effect on, on how because every every architect has a sort of proportion in them don't they but when i say that it's ugly uh, it's a it's a respectful uh term because i'm i'm thinking of of um how samson wrote about um 
Butterfield in terms of ugliness. Uh, it, for me, that that's um, that that's it's a sort of lack of elegance, but um, it's the sort of deep characteristics of, of a of someone who is a bit difficult, a bit diffident, but then when you get to know them better, uh, they're, they're, they're much you, you can form a more deeper, more satisfying friendship uh, with them. And that's that's the kind of. That's what I feel about the work. <clears throat> Thank you, Peter. That's a, that's a wonderfully, interestingly provocative way to uh, end the, the responses today, um, but I think it opens up aspects of the conversation uh, that I hope we can get into now for um, about uh, 15 or 20 minutes. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I think that this um, paint, paint, I mean, I think that we are really looking to talk about the oeuvre perhaps less than the individual, but it's impossible to separate them in some ways. And I think this iconoclastic character and quality of John's work, it's easy to to not think about it, but Geraint has reminded of, of us, uh, us just uh, how iconoclastic in a way this work is. Um, and I think both uh, Gordana and David's um, accounts also support that. Um, I um, I was just two brief things before I hand over to um, Geraint uh, and then Cortana. Um, I was in, we have been running a, a, some parallel series, actually part of a collaboration with Eric Parry Architects. Um, the one is called The Living Memory of Cities, but the other one uh, is called Presence, Person, Beauty. Um, and we had the last session last night with our speaker, Fabio Barry. Fabio was talking about um, the motif of round temples in the ancient world. And we came upon a discussion which I think John Utram would have certainly thought of as kind of second nature. We were talking about the, the round structure and temple-like structure that was constructed on top of the uh, the mundus, uh, the, the, um, ar the arguable uh, position of the mundus in the Roman forum in ancient times, which is according to myth, uh, where uh, in ancient times the the, the bounty every year would be thrown into the mundus, which was seen as the opening to the underworld. Um, and we talked a little bit in this series, uh, which is essentially about sacred spaces and their or origins, about whether this temple-like structure that sat above the mundus would have been perceived in some ways as beautiful or, or, or what kind of presence this architecture of the kind of interface between historical and mythic um, history um, would be. And Fabio said, well, it's, I was asking, would it have some kind of spooky presence because it's a very mysterious and strange place. And in a way, perhaps John reminds us of both that, of that tension in the idea of the beautiful in architecture between myth and reality, also reminding us that we need to have these places that have preserved the mystery or reconstruct it. And then the second dimension that I was just um, interested in, because um, I very much enjoyed the most recent Serpentine Pavilion, which was produced by South Africa Counter Space. Um, and in fact, the youngest architect, a, a young woman from South Africa, who I've had the pleasure of working with um, at the University of Johannesburg, Sumaya Valley. And she called her, her firm Counter Space because she said every a bit, a kind of a, um, uh, a kind of metaphysical idea uh, taken as a, 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 a kind of law of physics that every space has its equal and opposite counter space. Um, and this, of course, is a, a theme that we see that Geraint has picked out in relation to Foucault and John's worlds, his other world, which seems to exist on the other side of reality, also hints at, but it is, as Peter has said, an iconoclastic world, a world that speaks of everything that has been marginalized or concealed. And it creates an interesting resonance between um, the young Sumaya Valley, an up and coming architect who's in fact been named one of the Time 100 future leaders um, and John uh, and John Utram. And just recently in this world of reality that we call Instagram, I've, I've shown Sumaya John's Instagram feed and now she's addicted to it. So just some quick reflections before we go to Geraint uh, for uh, feed for perhaps some comments or thoughts. Um, and then we can take more input from the uh, panel members and take any questions from the audience. So over to you, Geraint. Well, thanks, thanks Matthew. And, and thanks, um, 
to, to all of our speakers, Gordana, David and Peter, really fascinating. So much to respond to there. Um, where to start? I mean, I'm uh, blown away by your your personal recollections of working in the practice. And I think it's a unique event from that, that perspective. I've been scribbling away and I regret in some cases not, not having had access to those some of those um, reminiscences before. Uh, although having said that, uh, for the book, I did do a series of um, kind of oral history interviews um, uh, and um, I, I interviewed um, some former members of the practice, uh, some of whom are here. here. So um, that is important to me. Um, I love Gordana's um, image of John as the captain of a ship. Uh, I think that that really works. And of the um, of the notion of it, of embarking on on, on an adventure, uh, practice as an adventure. And David brings up John's amazing sense of humour, which I, can't, I I guess it's easy to take for granted. But he also, when I talked to David um, in researching the book, David made a point of bringing up the nature of John's laughter and, and the sound of John's laughter in, in the in the practice, in the atelier. And this is this is being important uh, mode of communication. Uh, uh, having said that, um, John John is a very funny man. He uh, and, and there's a direct connection with his creativity, but he is, at the same sense, uh, a very sincere person. And I think that that sincerity um, Peter touched on in his remarks. There's a notion that some of the works of this period, especially those sometimes described as Postmodern uh, are somehow arch or or cynical. There's a bit of you know wink wink going on, but John is absolutely playing it straight. He is absolutely sincere about not just about his architecture, but his vision for the city and what what he thinks is wrong and how to address problems of the past. Um, I love um, Gordana's phrase of the way in which John embodies theory um, through through his practice and through a series of works that that's a wonderful phrase embody because it brings us back to um, uh, of of um, the way the various ways in which architecture can um, respond to the human body um, not necessarily through classical sort of canonic proportions but um, the way in which um, a column can represent a figure um, and uh, how that relates to some of the um, kind of mytho mythological imagery. I guess one of the main structuring devices in, in talking about John in the book is this idea of um, a kind of dualism or a juxtaposition or a, um, a diatonomy. Uh, and there are so many of these opposites which provide a kind of structure for some of the the, the kind of intellectual framework behind the architecture. One, of course, is the the um, diatonomy between the pragmatic and the conceptual. It, in my talk, I um, focused on on the world of John's imagination, which is incredibly fecund and and rich. And throughout his life, he's been writing and drawing without ceasing. But on the other hand, um, you know, as I said, I didn't show you any photos of the buildings. He is also an incredible detailer. This is incredibly important to him. The way he puts together buildings is, is really important. The way they touch the ground, the, the way they meet the sky, um, the way that the components touch one another or don't. Uh, and he, it's important to maybe to remark in this uh, connection that he was a student at the Regent Street Poly first and then going to the AA and, and the differing approach to those two schools of architecture, particularly when John was studying in the 50s, he, he learned to detail in a way that I don't think architects now do. He learned to do drainage uh, on the one hand and he learned to draw shadows. He was taught the, the practice of skiography. So uh, this notion of the pragmatic, the builder, the architect as builder is present in his work, but it doesn't preclude the, the territory of the imagination. I loved also David's allusion to the the different levels of hiddenness 
And this notion of occlusion or almost dissimulation, kind of cryptic tactics, it seems strange to um, remark on that, but I think, um, I, think, I think that is a characteristic in different ways. Um, the way John uses um, abstraction. So he has a, a narrative or a, a mythology, and then he kind of, there's a layer of abstraction on top. Or, or, or two stories, two images are layered one on top of the other. So sometimes the, the, the images is veiled deliberately. Um, the, 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 the viewer, the perceiver is made to work hard to get the meaning. It's not in your face. I think that's somehow quite, quite an important characteristic. Um, and, and lastly, I mean, um, I want to, I, I'm an architectural historian and it fascinates me how, how John uses architectural history in his thinking and in his work. Obviously, um, um, this is an era in which, um, in which architectural history and, and history is being rediscovered. You could talk about the historical turn in architecture, it being rediscovered in all sorts of ways. Um, and what fascinates me about about John's work is the way he sometimes uses architectural history and, and texts as a jumping off point, as a springboard for his imagination. And there's a few examples of this in the book, but I, I can't think of anyone else. So, so John is kind of reading a, a, a textbook and there's an image in the textbook in which he seizes and actually brings, builds, you know, effectively bring, brings bridges through to the world of practice. I mean, the one example um, is in a text by Indra Kagis McEwen, where, where she speculates that the the pediment um, the the the, the, uh, the pediment of, of a Greek temple could almost take off. It could almost fly through the air or sail across the sea. And and John really makes hay with this image, and it recurs um, the flying pediment. Um, of course, it, it relates also to his national service as as a RAF pilot too, but um, that's another aspect of John's career. So um, that amazing richness and um, highlighting the creativity of, of um, returning to works of architecture in the past, but also the interface between that and the world of the imagination. So on that note, I think I'll close. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I in this last uh, 10 minutes or so um, that we can uh, keep the conversation going, I would like to invite any of the other panel members to come back on any points they've now reflected on or or anything that uh, Geraint has said. Um, and also members of the audience, if you'd like to ask any questions, do put your hand up using the put your hand up function. Uh, and uh, I will come to you uh, directly. So um, on that note, I'm going to go straight over to Gordana and then David. Go ahead, Gordana. Yes, uh, thank you, Matthew. And thank you all for wonderful points from David, Peter and, and Geraint again. Um, yes, uh, just it, it's so many things to say. One can't say everything, but just some thoughts that came as we were talking. Um, we were all sort of mentioning um, the word classical and linking John to classical. And perhaps we have to kind of really sort of say something about it because it's really not quite classical. If anything, we could say that it's anything but classical in, in terms of um, thinking that classic, classicism or, and being classical means that it is accepting a set of rules and and, and if you want mathematical rules, philosophical rules, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and then applying them rigorously, interpreting them rigorously, etc., so, so, uh, which is based on some kind of knowledge which is respected, which could be traced back to Greece, ancient Greece, etc. So we can't say that we are dealing with that here, uh, or if we are dealing, we are dealing with them. Um, a very, very particular version of classicism or cla or being classical, something which is apparently classical, or something which is even to some extent, I would say, frivolously classical. And in that sense, this kind of notion of frivolous, I think, is also quite important uh, for John. I would sort of, uh, I just wanted to introduce it, because it is an important thing uh, when
are being cre when one is being creative, when one is uh, uh, designing, when one is uh, using imagination. To what extent you allow your imagination to kind of carry on, carry you on? To what extent you start to kind of restrict yourself and control yourself, and so on and so forth. And John is sort of with his kind of attitude, which we could say in the best possible sense, uh, in the same way that uh, Peter was mentioning, ugly. Uh, as a useful uh, term here, because some of his uh, buildings, in particular, some later ones, or the text one, Texas one, that's very difficult to kind of even look at. Um, so, you know, it is important to introduce uh, the notion of, of ugly or the notion of frivolous, because something like that is, is, is going on. But at the same time, it could be seen as something that came to life. And ultimately, if a building is built, it means it came to life. It seems somebody uh, kind of validated it, the client, the society, whoever, but it validated, you know, it's a kind of, if that's uh, what, um, what Peter called ugly building triumphed, it came to life, then it's a kind of interesting phenomena to kind of address what were the conditions that sort of magically let that happen. And you know how come that um, you know so many people are, are are kind of prepared to allow John Newton so much frivolity when they are not uh, prepared to allow it to some other people. So I just throw it like that. Thank you. Um, yes, this idea of coming to life is is, is interesting because it, it's so true in a lot of the the works and even the making of the buildings. The, this sense of like, if you like, animation that John would bring to the material construction of the building, a kind of breathing of life uh, into them. And also this tradition of classicism, because as Geraint was speaking, and especially that image of the tricorso, which I don't remember seeing, but the kind of the eye that is partly a pen um, and is hovering above the mountains. I was reminded in the uh, that famous portrait of um, Alberti, where you see the flying eye with the wings on it. It's a sort of a, a I mean, John is perhaps the architect who inherits from Alberti Many architects of the 20th century have written textbooks or manifestos, but it is perhaps John who, through his works, has produced something of a treatise. And that is something um, that uh, speaks to a very rich culture as opposed to the culture that is an impoverished culture, which Peter has hinted at, notwithstanding the fact that I think we have some fantastic thinkers and architects out there, not least teaching in our studios, so not to get too down on that idea. But let's go to David. David, you have some uh, responses. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on Geraint's point about how John's uh, imagination could take flight from an unlikely image or a book as part of his kind of the, the world that feeds him. His imagination also took flight from the situation he found himself in, by which I mean in the case of harp heating, his imagination took flight from a building, you know, an existing building that was really sort of degree zero uh, building that he got to work again in all sorts of ways. And I think there's a relationship with, well, there's a relationship obviously with conservation you know, and we look at the Judge Institute where John would even take parts of the building that were generally deemed to be unworthy or, or worthy of demolition and turn them into something, you know, uh, a vital part of the building and, and the, the scheme of the building. I'm talking about the, the, the attic uh, floor that was added in the 20s and was sort of despised until John just took it as a departure point to, to turn it into something both useful and functional and, well, beautiful or ugly, or whatever. I mean, John was always interested in the fact that, you know, to have a good conversation, you couldn't have it in an empty, dull, neutral room. You need a thesis and an antithesis to, to you know, to, to get the conversation going. Um, so I think there's a relationship, you know, I mean, John's imagination was fired by the real situation he found himself in and that that relates to conservation and it also relates to you know the notion of you know change continuity time the future the past 
the whole kit and caboodle. Thanks, David. Um, please do, uh, members of the audience, uh, put your virtual hand up if you'd like um, to say something. Um, otherwise, we'll just uh, continue on one or two of these uh, threads of discussion before we close. Um, I guess I have a last uh, question or provocation to the speakers or to members of the audience about John's relevance today. When I heard that Geraint, Geraint was writing this book and also coming out of um, recent events that have taken place online, there has been this rising interest in the work of John Utram again, but also of architects actually more broadly of uh, this period, the 80s and 90s. Um, and if you like a, a, re a reappraisal, certainly after the backlash against postmodernism that took place uh, for some time, and certainly in our school and other schools, you're seeing uh, an almost um, a recalibrated interest in some of the uh, specifically the um, motifs of composition and certainly the relevance and um, function of storytelling in architecture. So I wonder if that speaks to something about this wider dissatisfaction with the feeling of, um, you know, an impoverishment in the wider culture out there, or perhaps also a um, reappraisal of the function of culture in our cities, the idea that buildings, especially, I mean, the seventh right in Geraint's uh, seven rights from John was the right of the facade. What is the function of facades in regard to the, the wider well-being of the world that we that we have made for ourselves? In some ways, the kind of instrumentalization of our cities has created an erosion of perhaps what we enjoy as citizens. And one of the lessons we get from John and his extraordinary storytelling facades, not to say, uh, I mean, even a, a, a column and elements of the building interiors, such as the Judge Institute, tell these stories. Uh, perhaps there is a spirit that is returning. I think it's also perhaps in some way the spirit that gave rise to last year's serpent, uh, the previous to last year's Serpentine Pavilion winning uh, the project by Counterspace, where these echoes of um, a, uh, a kind of pre-modern architecture were uh, or let's say a vernacular architecture were put together in this temple space, um, which recalls some hidden history that needs to be uncovered or a parallel world that needs to be revealed. So I'm wondering about this drift back towards an interest in this storytelling idiom and a drift back to that to the architecture of that period. Any thoughts? I could I could try and say something. Yeah. I mean, um, to me, the, the 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 I think there is a, there is a dilemma for architects at the moment about how to react to the very important questions of today. I'm I'm talking about climate change, really, uh, and um, I'm I'm not sure. That I think anymore that a, that a drift back is is the right thing to be thinking about. Um, I've just in in our studio. I think um, we what I what I think is relevant <coughs> and what I would like to engage with is uh, is is the something of the fictional element of this architecture, and I'm talking really about imagery. Um, uh, I'm talking about the imagery of nature, uh, of of his amazing ability to make an architecture out of out of stories. Um, and and maybe I'm thinking specifically about his reference to rivers and trees and so what I'm really talking about is how uh, how do architects react to the situation we're in now? What kind of architecture are we trying to make that isn't just relying on uh, the um, te technical um, <coughs> issues to do with the materials we're using and uh, the way we <coughs> The way our buildings work environmentally, but what kind of um, language we have to invent to make a real architectural culture out of that—that that to me is an interesting question, and and 
and when I reflect on what um, John Utram was doing, I, I think it's I think it's relevant because I think you need those beliefs in order to make that architecture meaningful. Thanks, Peter. I think this theme of architectural language is very nice that you brought us back to that. Um, and uh, I don't see any hands going up, so I think on this note, I'm going to go back to Geraint to give you the final word before I just uh, close and say say thank you to everyone. Geraint, if any last words. Well, I think I think it's really relevant that, that Peter highlights sort of nature imagery and and perhaps more specifically the the interrelation between nature and culture. Above all, John is an architect who is interested in culture. Again, that's something that's so simple we could we could overlook that. Jo John came of age as an architect when Rainer Bannum, um, in theory and design in the first machine age, urged architects to drop to, you know, drop their cultural loads, to shed their cultural loads and run with the technologists. That was the direction of architecture. Now, in the book, I devote quite a lot of space to John's student years because I think they're really interesting. It shows him him in formation as an architect. His student projects are incredible. They're archigram before archigram um, in quite a literal sense. And he he is really interested in megastructures. He's writing in the in the architectural journals in the 50s um, about a kind of high tech future. And then then something happens. Um, he changes course and discovers culture. He discovers Greece, the Mediterranean, the monumental city. And, um, and, and, and from that moment on, there's, there's a great consistency. And there's a, there's a sense of, from I think the, the idea of the Greek city, there's this sense of the citizen in, in a kind of performative space, the, the way in which we share, um, um, uh, we, we share something with our common citizens in, in the forum and architecture reflects that um, shared space and those shared obligations and responsibilities. Um, uh, and that goes down to the level of decoration and, and the very serious function of decoration of the facade, the urban facade. Um, and on, on the subject of, subject of nature, I'm reminded of the pumping station where he was designing a building um, to for flood relief to relieve the city of excessive rainwaters, and the bunk, the building had to function for a hundred years. But that he then starts to think, well, will there be summer rainstorms in a hundred years' time? How will the climate have changed since then? He's engaging so long ago with climate change, and um, uh, I think that's. That, that's really interesting in the way he links those things together. So both in a pragmatic way, David highlights the environmental um, uh, innovations of, of projects like um, the um, witch project and harp heating, the, the reuse, the rehabilitation of existing structures, like for example, the judge where he engages with a listed building, uh, but also that in a more metaphysical sense our relation as as humans with with nature and the constancy of nature that that's probably a good point to close uh, i think proceedings for tonight thanks Geraint. um so this has been so we're coming up to we've just come up to seven o'clock it's been great to uh, to have you all here for this discussion to celebrate the book thank you to Geraint franklin also to uh gordada fontana giusti david bass and peter singen on our panel tonight Thank you to Beatrice Ducali and Daria Buchanowska for organizing it. And thank you also to all of you. It's also great to see uh, Mojda, Uma, uh, Ileona, and of course, John Utram also. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, do uh, stay in touch with what we're doing on the Center for Urban and Built Ecologies uh, web pages. Good night, everyone. Bye. Thanks very much. Good, good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Matthew. I listened downstairs because oh. I was so embarrassed by that. By that awful man. Yeah, having.